So we're here today to talk about how to build Google Plus applications. Uh, I think today you've already learned a little bit about the Plus One button and Hangout applications. Uh, I want to talk about this in a little bit wider context. So what are APIs are available? What are some of the principles behind the APIs that we've made available? And where can you expect some of this stuff to go in the future, right? So I'll start with a quick introduction. That's a picture I actually took this morning. So as you can see, I look a little bit sleepy, but that's normal in conferences. Uh, but I'm Chris Chabot. I work in the Google Plus team as a developer advocate. I also manage the developer relations team within Google Plus. And I've been at anything social at Google for the last three and a half years. So if you've been here in previous years in Prague, chances are maybe you've seen me talk about open social, Google Buzz, or some of the other projects I've been on. So what I'm here to talk about is this thing. And what this thing stands for is the thing that really excites me. What we're saying is that we're building Google+, Plus, and what we're really doing here is putting you at the center of Google. And that means something magical to me. It's not just we're building another social network. The thing that we're doing is that we're taking a step back and we're saying, the web is evolving to a point where people are becoming crucially important to everything that we do on the web. Whereas previously, you had links between documents, there was information inside of the documents. Social awareness, awareness of people that you're connected with and you're sharing with, is becoming increasingly important for every experience on the web. So we wanted to say, how are we going to take that and make that a core part of Google, right? How are we going to make everything we do better? And when I say everything, I mean, how do we make search better? You've seen a plus one session on some of those technologies. How are we going to make ads better so that ads will be more relevant to you if you want to tell us who you are and what kind of stuff you're into? How can we make Android better? How can we make YouTube better? How can we make Gmail better and Google Apps better? And everything we do at Google, we think, can be much better by putting people at the center of it. So that's why we have the plus you nowadays in the toolbar there, because we're saying Google is becoming all about you. If you will tell us who you, are, who you are, we can make Google that much more personalized and relevant and easy to use for you. So that's part of what we're talking about here today. So uh, can I just see a raise of hands of who, who has used Google Plus? Everybody, that's awesome. So that's, I'm talking to the right room then, that's beautiful. So, if you've used Google+, Plus, I think you've noticed that it has a specific feel to it, right? There's something about Google+, Plus that makes it a pretty unique place, whereas some social networks are about very short status updates and other social networks are for brief conversations. There are certain things that make a social network for what it is. Uh, and I kind of like what Google Plus does. There's a, a lot of things that go into it. It could be the larger input box when you're typing. It could be the real-time nature of how you see plus ones and comments coming in the moment you've posted something there. There's something about the length of the comments as well that made it a very different type of destination than some of the other places on the web. I notice, for instance, that the, the things that the people I follow are posting there tend to be much longer. They have much more information in there. There's a conversation going on, and the comments that people are posting to it are in-depth comments to the conversation that's happening. It's not just, I'm drinking a cola today. No, it's actually, this is how I feel about politics. This is how I want to organize my birthday party. There, there's a conversation going on there. It's an inherently, incredibly social place beyond just my blogging or broadcasting. And I think that's pretty magical. There's something to the DNA of it. So when we're talking about building applications for Google+, these are some of the things that are very important to keep in mind, because maybe you've built a social application already for another platform. Uh, and if you're like me, any engineer is very good at being effective. So you're thinking, well, I can just copy the application I made for a different platform, put it on Google+, and we're done, right? Uh, and the thing that I'm trying to say is that that maybe could work, but maybe try to think about what makes Google Plus the special place that it is, right? And how can I leverage that kind of behavior, that kind of conversation, community forming, real-time nature, and all those other things that make Google Plus an exciting place? How can I take that and make my own application fit better within that model and the things that make Google Plus a special place? Of course, one of the things that is definitely essential to it is the concept of circles. Now, you've probably all been in the keynote, you've seen the earlier sessions that kind of touch on the subject as well. So uh, it kind of depends on you how much detail you want to hear about me. Who would like to hear more about circles? 
there's like oh, there's about 50% of the room. So I'll do about 50% of my normal talk on circles then. So the thing that's really exciting about circles is that we said sharing on the web is currently broken. Whenever you post something on one of the leading social networks, you're posting it probably somewhere between 200 or 300 of your friends. And all of those friends are kind of the same, right? At least that's how they're treated on the network. But in real life, you have family, you have parents, you have your best friends that you share everything with. You have your programming club, maybe, that you're a member of, or the book club, or the Harley Davidson club. And you don't necessarily want to say, well, I found some research on a disease that happened in my family, and post that to the entire world. Uh, I just want to share that with my family, right? On, if, on the other hand, I make a picture of wonderful Prague, I want to share it to everybody. So it needs to be as good for a whisper as a shout. Out. It needs to be as private or as public as you want it to be. And we found that people are really getting that. About two thirds of the content that's being shared on Google Plus is targeted content, is private content. And that makes sense because usually the content you share with a limited audience, that's the content that matters the most with the people that matter the most, right? So it's an incredibly powerful concept. And if you have some questions about it, uh, come find me in the session afterwards and I can wax poetically for hours if need be. The other thing that I noticed on Google Plus is because of all the things we just touched, the concept of circles, the concept of real-time communication and everything else that's going on there, hangouts, there's something magical happen there, happening there. One of the things that always inspired me in history is that when you look at like new forms of art being invented or even things like skateboarding or anything else that's revolutionary in our history is often a group of people coming together and then learning of each other. Of course, there's always a competitive element going on of who's better at it, that's just part of human nature, but we're still learning together as a group, as a society. And that's one of the behaviors that I'm also very much seeing on Google+. And in fact, this is a picture of me on one of the photo walks. And the concept of a photo walk is that a bunch of people come together and say, wouldn't it be fun to go make pictures together? Go out to some interesting place and make some photographs. And this was with Trey Radcliffe and Thomas Hawk and myself and a few other people. And we were doing the Stanford University. And we had over 200 people showing up there. And those 200 people, they were talking about gear, of course, and cameras and their preferences of what they like making pictures of. But the most inspiring thing is that even in one event, in one day, there were so many new relationships being built, so many new friendships. And there were so many people who said, I've never tried taking a picture of that kind of a detail. Or I've never tried to look at it in this light. And there are so many lessons being learned between all of the people there. And that made it pretty unique. And this was just one event. We're, we're seeing hundreds of these events happening everywhere. And not just in photography, but we're also seeing it between female bloggers and female people in the IT world. We're seeing it with people doing yoga together in Hangouts. We're seeing it with surgeons helping people in Africa. We're seeing it uh, in every community that's Worth mentioning, we're seeing exciting things happening on Google+, Plus, where this model of communicating with each other, the real-time nature and everything else around it, makes this such an amazing place for people to talk to each other, connect with each other, to learn with each other. So uh, there's a magical thing happening. So that's the last principle I wanted to touch on before we move on to the actual platform part. That if you build an application that has something to do with community and connecting people together, that's very likely to be a very successful application for the Google Plus community. So I, I hope you guys are still with me after the, that short introduction. And we're ready to move to the platform. But before we do that, uh, I kind of wanted to start with a bit of a background of why are we building the platform the way that we are building it. And after that, I'll actually dive into the technology of what's available today. So when I wrote a blog post announcing the launch of our APIs, I started with this quote. It's one of my favorite quotes because it always stimulates my imagination of what's possible once you get started on a project, right? Google Plus has been one of those projects. We said this is a field trial. It's limited. And we've only very recently opened it up for everybody to sign in. But the platform is kind of being developed in that way, too. We're being deliberate. We're moving slowly. And of course, moving slowly in a Google world means that we're releasing new stuff every two weeks. So it's not glacial speed exactly right. But we're still saying we're starting with a very careful baseline. 
And the reason for that is because, of course, we share the objective of we want to have a healthy, thriving ecosystem for developers where everybody can build applications and be successful on their platform. But we also said that looking back at history and the history of social platforms, there have been a few things that don't, didn't necessarily work out so well. One of the things that definitely happened, and uh, I don't know who here has built social applications before. That's a good few of you. Uh, and who here has built like applications for Twitter or Facebook or MySpace? Uh, yeah, that's a good number still too. So if you've lived through that history, you probably know that these platforms, they started, here's everything, here's every API call that we can think about, use it in any way you want to, and we're just going to expect good stuff to happen. But good stuff, unfortunately, didn't necessarily happen. Uh, I know that I was personally incredibly excited when Facebook opened their first platform in 2007 for 2008. And I thought this is going to change everything, right? But unfortunately, if you look at some of the historical things that happened on that platform and many others like it, is that they started with a completely open platform and then they saw some people taking advantage of some of the things. Or they weren't using it in a way that it was intended or a lot of spam was created or uh, et cetera, et cetera. There's a lot of behavior there that wasn't necessarily the best behavior that you could use for, for hope for, for the users. Users were surprised that they were spamming their friends. They were surprised that their information was used in ways that they were not necessarily comfortable with. And quite often what happens in these situations where there's a lot of contention of how a platform is used is that they say, okay, sorry, now we're going to have to take a step back and we're going to have to close down certain parts of the platform. We're going to have to completely change if you can show up in the stream or not. Or we're going to completely say, these kind of applications that you've built and built companies around, they're not okay anymore either. And in the end, developers end up being hurt and end users end up being hurt. So we believe that putting everything out there and then saying, let's see what happens, and then finding out that we did the wrong thing and we have to take it back again, hurting both our users in the process as well as you as developers in the process, that's not necessarily the best way to build a platform, we think. So we took a completely different approach and we said, we're going to start with the safest possible first step of this journey. We're going to give you an API for getting profile information, public profile information, and public activities, public comments, and plus ones. And we're going to see how you're going to use that. And you can tell us how you want to use it, and what functionality you're missing in there, what you want to see added to it. And in a conversation between our users and our developers and ourselves, we want to learn together what the platform should look like when it's done. So we want to go on this journey, but we want to go on this journey with you. And that's why we put our first safe release out there. And we expect to keep iterating on this, keep adding functionality to it based on the conversations that we're having with you as developers. So if after the session you have any feedback for me at all, or if you're watching this on a recording, or if you didn't catch me after the session, you can find me on Google Plus as well. I'm Chris Chabot. Uh, send me your feedback. Let me know. This conversation is incredibly important for all of us. So the other part that I quickly wanted to share is that when we're talking about the Google Plus platform, there's another, a number of components that go into it. First of all, of course, there's the APIs, and that's what I'm going to be talking about today. And APIs are the basic HTTP, RESTful APIs. You use OAuth, and they return JSON. Uh, if you're a social web developer, you've used these kind of APIs before. They will feel like home to you. And they allow you to get all the basic social information you would expect out of a platform, right? Uh, the next thing that we're developing is widgets. The first widget you're already familiar with, especially if you've been in an ADE session, and that's the plus one button. But we think that there should be more widgets like that. And it's the easy way to say, I want to take Google's functionality in Google's pe pixels, and I want to put it on my own website. And finally, we're also thinking about how can we build extension points. Now, I'm sure that some of you may have seen the games functionality in Google+. Plus. That's a typical example. But Jonathan did a session just before me as well talking about the Google Hangouts APIs, where you can build applications that run inside of Google's property. So where widgets are putting Google's pixels on your website, this is putting your pixels inside of Google's website. And we've seen a few initial steps at what that could look like, but we're very excited about exploring this more. Like, the place where most people go to find applications is Google Search. Wouldn't it be kind of cool if we can make Google Search better so that you as a developer can put signals in there? Or wouldn't it be great that in the stream maybe you could put some polling functionality in there? Or, uh, there are so many possible extension points there. 
that we're slowly moving towards figuring out what would make the most sense and what would be the most effective both for our users and our developers. Uh, and the Hangouts, I think, is a, a great example of some of the first steps we're taking in that regard. So when we're talking about a platform, we're talking about APIs, widgets, and extensions. I wanted to start with the APIs today. And the thing with the APIs is that we've said because we know that there are certain things that will make it easier for the end users to discover an application if you actually register it and put your name in there so people can follow the link when they see a post, etc. On the other hand, we also wanted to say that whenever there is actual bad behavior that our users are noticing, like their privacy isn't being respected in a way that it should, or a website doesn't have a privacy policy, etc., uh, etc., et we want to be able to, to step in there and say, hey, we want to be able to contact you and work with you on fixing it. And if there's no situation where something could be fixed, we want to be able to protect our users and our ecosystem by disabling applications as well. So we've said that to be able to call our APIs, you need to register your application first. And the place where you register your application for calling our APIs is in the developer console. If you've used any of our other APIs, like Translate or Google Buzz, uh, Search APIs, uh, there's, a, I think, about 87 nowadays under this new API interface. You've seen this developer console before. The thing that you go do there is that you go in here and you say, hey, I'm going to create a new project. You come in this overview. The next thing that you do is then you have to indicate which services you want to use. As I said, there's a lot of different services we have in here. Some of the examples that I'm seeing here, like uh, the AdWords, uh, Google Buzz, of course, is in there. The Search API is in there. Uh, our SQL API are in there. But the really relevant one at the moment is, of course, the Google Plus API. So the thing that you do is that you just check the box saying, yes, I want to enable these APIs for my client ID. And then you could start calling them. The other thing that you will notice is that when you're using the Google, uh, Google Plus APIs, there's a limit to it. If you zoom into the part here, the courtesy quota that we're giving developers at the moment is 1,000 queries per day. Uh, there's two things that I wanted to say about that. The first is we're taking a, a deliberate approach to allowing applications to happen, right? We don't want to stimulate the land rush type of behavior. So there's a, a small time window in which we want to see what type of applications are people building. We want to make sure that they, they kind of smell right, they have the right feeling to it, and people are not abusing things that we never imagined could be abused. Because, of course, in the world, there's so many smart people out there. They will do things with APIs that we never expect. And in fact, I, I remember one famous Googler saying that a platform isn't done until your developers completely surprise you. So in the first time period, we want to be a little bit careful. We expect to raise this number in the future. But there's a link right next to it where it says request more. If you fill in your information about this is the application that I'm building, this is where you can find it on the web, uh, and put a number in there that's semi-reasonable, so don't ask for 10 billion API calls a day, maybe ask for 100,000 if that's what you need for your traffic, uh, then my team will actually go through that list of people who are requesting APIs, and we grant most of them, uh, as long as you're not doing anything evil, and evil is of course a subjective term, but I think you'll know it when you see it, and as long as you have a privacy policy as well. That's one of the things that we say in a terms of service. You need to have a privacy policy of what you will do with users' information. As long as you qualify for those things and you're not asking for too high a number, uh, your quota re request will be approved pretty quickly. As soon as you've gone through all of that, uh, you need to copy a few values. Whenever you register an application, you enable a number of APIs, you get an application ID. You get a key that you need to use. Uh, you can see that here, it's called the API key. Uh, I replace mine with dummy, dummy API key so you guys can't copy it. <laughs> So you take that API key, and using that API key, you can now start calling unauthenticated API endpoints. We have a whole bunch of public information, so about reading activities, posts, plus ones, reshares, etc. Because it's all public information, you don't even necessarily have to authenticate to get to that information, right? But we still want to be able to identify you as a developer, so that we do that through the API key. So, as I touched on before, we have public data APIs, and that's kind of what I wanted to go into right now. 
the interesting thing that we're seeing is that there's actually quite a few interesting things that you can do with public data APIs already. Like most of the stuff that I'm broadcasting are updates about Google+, developer related information, photos, etc., etc. Getting that information and showing it like in a blog or on a globe or doing a cool visualization or doing social scoring on it or the many other things that people are building. This is a pretty exciting first step, and even if it doesn't really do everything that you want out of a Google Plus platform just yet, uh, we are releasing new features every couple of weeks. So this is a great time to get familiar with the way that the API works and start proting, uh, prototyping some of the beginnings of your application, so that when we make the stuff that you're waiting for available, you'll be able to hit the ground running, right? So uh, I kind of touched on what is available, but I just wanted to give you a quick visual overview. In our endpoint, we call this activities. And the reason for that is uh, on our front end, we call this post because you post something to Google+. But the standards that we're using for our REST APIs is called activity stream. And the concept of an activity stream is that there's a blob of information in there. And a blob of information has some know-how about who is the author, who wrote this thing. What were they doing? In this case, the example that I'm using, they're posting a note. But it could also be a check-in, for instance. Or there could be a number of other activities happening in this stream. And finally, of course, there's the content of the thing itself, which would be in a note field. In this case, the, f the line you see above there saying, I love Android, congratulations, etc." That will be the content in the post. But it can also have attachments, like you could attach pictures to it, you can attach movies to it, you can attach links to it, and that will be an attachment on that activity as well. So that's what you get in the activity stream. Then we also give you plus ones when you just read a list of activities and we'll say there's 101 plus ones on that. And there's another API call that will actually show you exactly which people plus one stuff. Then there's also the same deal for shares. So if you read an activity, it will say there's been 20 shares. If you want to know more about who exactly shared it, there's another REST endpoint where you can get that information for this activity. And finally, we include the comments in there. And of course, that's a big part of the whole social interaction. And they're shaped much in the same way as the original post. So because they are public APIs, and I hope this is kind of readable on the screen, the, the green kind of falls away, I'll try to use a lighter font next time. Because they're public data APIs, calling them is incredibly simple. You can copy and paste the URL from the documentation. You could put the right API key there that you got when you registered your application, hit enter in your browser, or use one of your favorite command line utilities, and you will just see the JSON coming out of it. So it, it's a very easy way to see, I wonder what this API called us, you can start playing with it right away, right? The stuff that's in there is, of course, a little bit bigger than I showed in the previous example, but it's all the information that you would expect to have when you're looking at the front end of Google+. It's all of the posts, it's all of the comments and all the other stuff in there. I'm not going to go too much into detail about exactly what APIs are available either because we have such a great documentation site that you can find at developers.google.com slash plus, uh, that it feels like I were repeating stuff that you can read a lot faster yourself. But the thing that I did want to mention is that this is a completely new experience. It has a new design in it, and there's a lot of nifty features in there that maybe you're not expecting in Google documentation. If I look at some of the other APIs we launched previously, then I can honestly say that this is some of the best documentation we've ever written. So one of the features that I definitely like is that we have a great description of what does this endpoint do. In this case, it's, it, it searches activities. Then we show, hey, what parameters go into it, and we have these friendly human descriptions of everything that you can put in the query URL to make it do different things. For instance, with search, you can say, do, wanna, do I want to order it by the best results or the most recent results? How many results do I want to get back out of it, et cetera, et cetera. And then we also define like what is going to come out of it when I call this. So we have a complete definition of this is what the JSON object will look like. And as you can see, there's also these are the descriptions for the fields that will come out of it. The next exciting part is that we then have what we call an API explorer. And that means that for every one of these functions, you can plug in a user ID of whatever fields are required to call this API. You hit execute. And it will actually just show you this is the result of that API call. And you can do that authenticated. You can do that the non-authenticated public APIs. It's such a nice way to actually get like that finger speeds and gefool for how an API works before you even start coding. Uh, 
And you can see like what information is there, what, are, what should I keep in mind in the design of my application, etc. Uh, I know that I as a developer really appreciate getting that feeling for an API before getting started. Uh, another feature that I think is really nifty is that one of the things we did completely differently with the Google Plus API and a few APIs before that is that we said APIs at Google right now are, well, to be frank, a little bit of a mess because we had some APIs that were JSON, some of them were GData, others were XML, the other ones were SOAP. Uh, the authentication mechanisms they use weren't always the same. Maybe the terms of service weren't even compatible between them. So we said we want to build a new API infrastructure, and we are going to call that the discoverable API. The thing that makes it discoverable is that you download one of the new API clients, and there's a long list of them. There's six programming languages that we support. So chances are that it is available in your favorite language, if, of course, your favorite language is Java, Ruby, Python, PHP, C Sharp, and JavaScript. Am I forgetting something? Sorry? Yeah, .NET. Yeah, I said C Sharp. That's kind of the same world, right? So there's a whole bunch of libraries available for your language. And what you do is that you create an API client and you say, I want to start using this service, like Google Plus or the SQL backends or storage or et cetera. And you can start calling those services with that API client. It's all discovery based. So it will download a document, configure it itself for all the functions that are available and just work. It's a completely new experience, at least if you use the Google APIs, right? And that really is an exciting thing to me because it starts making Google this toolbox of useful features that you as a developer can use. You register your application once, you say, I want to use these APIs. I think Translate is going to be useful. Search is going to be useful. I want to have social information in there, and I want to have SQL storage as a backend. You can start using it in your API client. It's a very nice system. The other thing that we're doing is that we're building starter projects as well, because even if you have great documentation and you have a library that's relatively easy to use as well, there's always some subtleties and nuances in there about how do I exactly get an OAuth token, how do I store it in a session or in a database, etc. So we've been built starter projects, you can download it, you unarchive un them, and you've got like a template of a hello world type of application that does all of those things for you. So getting started with the Google Plus APIs is going to take you all about, about five minutes, and four of those minutes are going to be spent in the developer console. So it's a really friendly experience, and I'd highly encourage you to try it out. I think you're going to like it. So the way that you use that API client is you create the API client, and then you can just call the services that you've discovered. This is the Google Plus session, so my example is about activities in Google Plus as well. You would just say, I want to list activities. The person that I want to list activities for is myself, uh, and I want everything that's public. That's the only option right now. In the future, I imagine there will also be other fields in there. Then as soon as you have those activities, you can iterate through them, and you can do anything with the results that you can like. You, sh you can show the headlines on your blog, you can use it for your data analysis, etc., etc. Exactly the same code, but then in Java. Of course, Java does take twice as much text. That's just kind of the language that it is. Uh, but it is completely the same concept. You create an API client, you request the list activities, and you do something with the resulting activity list that you got out of it. And the same will be true in Ruby, and the same would also be true in like Python, C Sharp, and all of our other languages. So I'm not going to bore you too much with these code samples, because there's too many languages that we support. But I did want to kind of make the point of this really is that simple to use. Uh, this morning I went coding just to refresh my coding a little bit of using these APIs. I downloaded a client, I archived it, put the API key in there, and within five minutes I was building the next application. So here's part of that application that I actually really built in the speaker room this morning. And I said, well, I haven't used search that much yet. So I want to build a search front end that just shows me everything with GDD CZ in there, because that's the tag that we're using today, right? So it took a few lines of code. The lines of code were, I want to include the library. Then I'm going to create a client, and I'm going to tell the client, this is the API key that I'm using. Remember, it's public information, so we don't even need to authenticate to do a public search. And then I'm going to say, well, I want to have some parameters. I want to order by the best results, the most relevant. I want to have about 20 of them. 
And the query that I'm going to be looking for is GDD CZ. And then I just say activity search using these parameters. And I can loop for the results. So when I executed that, uh, because I never trust on the internet in these conferences, so I'm going to have a screenshot. I hope you'll forgive me. Uh, the layout, I didn't spend more than five minutes on this, so it's not the prettiest web page you're ever going to see in your life. But the thing that's interesting is that this took about five minutes to build, right? Here were the best search results this morning of the search term GDD CZ. So likewise, if you have an idea of, hey, wouldn't it be cool to list all of the pictures that were posted in Prague today? Or wouldn't it be cool to build an application that would show me all of the hangouts that are currently happening uh, in this group of people? Or wouldn't it be cool to build an application of whatever where you want to use search functionality? It, it takes about, what is this, 15 lines of code to build that. So it, it is that simple. Likewise, I built something that would show activities as well. So because I wanted to be able to use me as an identifier, I did have to put authentication in there. And authentication used to be one of the biggest topics in the sessions that I've done here previously in Prague, where I'd have to talk about how does OAuth work and redirect URLs and what is the encoding on the secret hashes and et cetera. Uh, and that wasn't the most fun part of the session. Uh, it wasn't the most fun part for you because that's where most people ran into issues when they were trying to call an API. They got stuck on OAuth. And it wasn't the most fun part for me either because it wasn't really about the product that I was excited about. So the nice thing about these libraries is that they take care of all this authentication nightmarish stuff for you. So all you have to do is to say, well, I'm going to call the authenticate method and it will ma magically take care of stuff for me. It's going to do the redirection dance, it's going to do the whole mangling on the tokens and the signatures and everything else. And what you get back is an OAuth token. You store it either in a session or the database or whatever storage you're using for your website. And you can start making authenticated calls. And one of the authenticated calls you can make is, uh, you can see there's a plus uh, arrow people, arrow get, uh, and then the user that I'm using is me. Because as soon as you're authenticated, the system knows which user just authenticated, right? So me, in this re regard, if I go through the process, will resolve to Chris Chabot. If Jonathan will go through it, it will resolve to Jonathan. It's the magic way of showing, of saying, show me the activities for the currently authenticated user. Couple of lines of code again. And the result is, again, forgive me the layout. Uh, here's the headlines of my most recent post on Google+. Uh, the thing that I did is that I made them link, so you can click on it and it actually goes to Google+. But if I had a few minutes more, I could very easily then show the content of the activity, see if there's a pictures attached to it, render them as well, etc. But the key takeaway is it's really easy to get started with. So if you're feeling at all inclined to start playing with this, do it. You'll have a lot of fun. Some of the people out there have already started doing that since we started this tour talking about the Google Plus APIs. One of the favorite things that I started using is minimal.me. Uh, and basically, it's a blog front end that uses the public post as the data for showing activities, right? So anything I show publicly now automatically turns into a blog for me as well. Wonderful little thing. Another company that we're talking to is Cloud. Now, Cloud is a social scoring kind of thing. I, who here uses Cloud? Uh, see, that's actually a very social audience. There was more people than I expected. The thing that Cloud does, and this is not a Google product at all, but that's why I like it, it's an external developer, is that they look at how much many times your activity has been either tweeted or reshared or posted about or plus one or et cetera. And they see how popular those users are that are doing that plus one and tweeting and resharing, et cetera. Uh, and they base a score on it. And they say, this is how popular or influential you are on the social web. Now, this is a little bit of an embarrassing screenshot for me because my cloud score has really gone down the toilet since Google Plus came out because I don't use any of the other social media anymore. I enjoy Google Plus that much. So I'm very excited to be working with cloud to make sure to have Google Plus support and my score will go back up again. That will be a good day. <laughs> And uh, another example of an application that I enjoyed a lot was like the Google Plus Globe, where people can authenticate, and it shows where the current Google Plus users that are using these applications are. And it's this beautiful 3D HTML5 rendered globe that you can spin around, zoom into, et cetera. And he's planning to add like activity to it as well. So, so the thing that he wants to make is like this beautiful globe where you see all these sparkles of where Google Plus activity is happening. And, the reason why I'm showing this is because 
even though we've only taken the first step and there's a little bit of functionality out there and not everything just yet, you can do so much wonderful stuff with this already. So I, I think that if you put your mind to it, we can come up with some pretty cool apps and at the same time take the next step forward. So with that, I'm kind of coming to the end of my session. They asked me to hurry up a little bit as well because after this we have to ignite talks and have to take down the walls back here. So. The summary is we're taking this one step at a time. We've taken the first step by both having public data APIs, the Hangout APIs, and of course the plus one button. The reason for that is that we kind of want to prevent the tragedy of the commons or the killing of the golden goose kind of mistakes. And we don't want to hurt you as developers and we don't want to hurt our end users. But we're incredibly eager to start engaging with you as a developer to hear what functionality are you looking for to build that really useful application that's going to delight our users, right? The other thing that I told you is that the things that we're building is APIs, widgets, and extensions. There's a few live examples out there already. Expect more of them in the future. Future. And finally, I gave you a brief overview of all the technical details behind the API. I didn't go too much into detail, but if you have any questions, me and my colleagues are on the mailing list. We're on Google Plus, and you can find me afterwards in the session as well. But it is so easy because of all these client libraries that I didn't feel I had to spend the majority of the session on it either. So I'm going to take that as a positive sign, right? So with that, I wanted to end this session, and I wanted to take it to Q&A. So if you have any questions, let me know. I yeah? Have a question. Uh, the activities, uh, it's uh, just for the user to access, to allow the API to connect, or uh, you can you know, say to, to API, I would like to view, for example, Alishka's activities or your activities. So the activity call takes a user ID, and whenever you fill with a user ID, that's the activities you will get back for it. Uh, of course, uh, with the caveat that it's public activities, right? Yeah, at the moment. Okay. Cool. Any other questions? Yeah? Uh, do you provide some how to help developers to change the UI of Google Cloud? For example, there is one, one Chrome extension which helps uh, with Hello Store. Mm -hmm. So that's an interesting question, actually. I'll repeat it for the people who are looking at the recording. The question was, are, is there going to be any functionality that's going to allow us to change the UI as a developer? And the reason why I say that it's an interesting question is because on the one hand, I fully recognize the power you would have to be able to change the experience to your own liking, right? But on the other hand, as I said in the intro, there are certain things that make Google Plus the place that it is, right? The length of the post, that's definitely one of the things to go into it, the real-time nature, the width of the display in there. There's so many things that make Google Plus the place that it is, the DNA of the social network that if we would strongly encourage complete customization of the experience, maybe some of the conversations wouldn't flow as naturally anymore. Maybe you would write incredibly short Google Plus posts because your user interface looks different than mine, and I would write really long ones, and we kind of get desynchronized from each other. We wouldn't be in the same social environment. So I don't know if we'll ever allow it. Uh, I can't rule it out for sure, but I do think that there's definitely a few things that we have to ask ourselves is what are the limits of this kind of customization to make sure that the Google Plus experience is still very much the Google Plus experience. Does that answer your question at all? Yes. Okay, perfect. So right now, we just have the, priv uh, the public read-only API. So you can't create posts. Even if I am authenticated, I'm authenticated. Correct. Mm -hmm. Correct, yeah. And like I said, this is the first step of a journey. And we want to make sure that, yes, we think that potentially it makes a lot of sense for you to be able to plus one things for your application or create posts or all of the other things that you're talking about. But we also know that if we just open it up to the world, 
Google Plus is going to be filled with World of Warcraft gold spam, right? And that's not going to be a positive experience for anyone. So we, we need to figure out the right way to say, this is how you can get content into Google Plus in a way that it's incredibly valuable to users. Like one of the things that we learned with previous iterations of our social efforts is that if you import messages from other networks, it doesn't feel human. Even though I post it on one social network and it gets copied to another social network, the people on this end notice that you're not replying to it and it has a different feeling to it and you're using different social ways of expressing things. And it feels like robotic content, right? Uh, robotic content is incredibly weird in a social setting. It feels like you're talking to an inanimate object and not an actual person. So that ruins the social experience in an environment. So we know we don't like that kind of experience. Experience. We also know that spam is an experience that nobody appreciates. We also know that there's a lot of things that could be incredibly useful. So, so there's a balance to be found there, and we're not quite sure what the balance is just yet. Yeah. Correct. So right now, the, the only thing that you get from authentication is that you can do the me parameter. But as soon as we have other forms of data that will require authentication, there will be the same authentication flow. So what would happen is if someday we say, we want to build an API to give you access to your private rabbit farm. I'm using rabbit farm as an example because I don't want to give away what we're going to be releasing next. But say that we say, we want to give you access to private information if you're authenticated. Then using the same OAuth flow, the same code you've written already, you would add a new OAuth scope to the request and then you can start calling that information as well. So that's why we put it out there, partially because it's useful for resolving the me identifier, but partially also because this is gonna be the infrastructure that everything else is gonna be built on top of. Cool. Any questions on this side? This seems to be the quiet side today. How are you guys? Hi. <laughs> no questions at all? Oh yes, thank you. Mm -hmm. So the question was, uh, currently there's a thousand queries per day quota. Uh, if I request an increase, will that cost me? Will I have to pay for it? No, that's not the, not the case at the moment. So it's just the thing that uh, my team is kind of in charge of doing the checks there. The things that we look at is, well, first of all, is this an okay application? And an OK application is a very wide polymific term, right? And what we mean with OK is you're probably not data mining stuff and sell it, selling it to the mafia. So we accept quite a bit, but there's certain type of behavior that would not be acceptable, right? And the next thing that we look at is does your application has a, a privacy policy? Do you tell your user what you will do with information? And let's be honest, that's, that's a very flexible term as well, right? You could tell your user, I'm going to take your information and publish it in a newspaper. That will be okay, it's a privacy policy. People know what's going to happen with their information. The important part for us is don't surprise the user, make sure they know what's going to happen with their information. And for the rest, we don't try to put too many moral boundaries around it. Does that answer your question? I think it answers more than your question, right? But cool. Thank you. Back there in the blue shirt. So what percentage is public? All right, so one of the things, and I did cover that early in the session, but it's okay, I'll repeat it. So one of the things that really excite me is that the whole concept of circles and targeted sharing is working incredibly well on Google+. So about two-thirds of all the information that's being shared is targeted private information. So one-third of it is public. On the other hand, if you look at some of the applications I showed in the end, Public information is pretty exciting in its own way as well, right? If Sko will post something, or Larry Page, or myself, or any of these other people, that can be very useful information. If you want to do social scoring or visualization for the public, you can do a lot of cool stuff with that already. Cool. Jonathan, you had a question? Correct. 
Yeah. Oh, I thought you had a question. What a shame. <laughs> but thank you, though. Uh, up here? Mm -hmm. uh, I can use them to you know, create posts. No, actually you can't. If you, uh, I guess you haven't been in the Hangout session. The Hangout API is quite a different thing, right? It doesn't create posts in a stream. What it is, is you've got up to 10 people doing real-time video chats and they share a real-time application with each other. So that, it's, that is its own little world. Now, the cool thing that you could do is if that application talks to a backend server, that backend server could use user IDs to call the REST API. So it's very easy to mix these things. And you'll see that the calling conventions are similar. They use the same user IDs and the same names and the same function names. So it's made to work together. But it's not a workaround to get stuff posted to the stream. Uh, if you do want to post stuff to the stream, then the plus one button is a great way to do that. If you have a public web page somewhere, you can put a plus one button on it. When people plus one it, they get an option to share that content. Uh, and this fits very much in us being careful and deliberate. If people explicitly say plus one and share, they are very sure that they want to share this with the people they're connected to, right? So that's a very safe first step to take. Uh, so, no, at the moment, there's no share without the plus one button. That's correct. Cool. Other questions? No? Okay, well, that's it for today, then. Thank you so much for attending, guys. Bye.